Keaton Markey here for AfterBuzz TV. I'm here with the creator and cast of Rocco's Modern Life, and I'm having some major 90s nostalgia right now. So first of all, I have to say thank you to you all for my childhood and my favorite cartoon growing up. Um, and I'm so happy it's coming back to TV and coming back to this generation. Can you guys tell me a little bit about kind of why you're bringing it back now? Joe, maybe this is a good one for you? Because <laughs> uh, we were asked to. <laughs> No, uh, it seems to be really resonating with with a lot of people, and, and over the years, it seems to age well, and uh, and it's I actually feel like more people know about it now than they did in the '90s, and so it would seem like a good fit for Nickelodeon to say, you know, would you be interested in bringing it back for at least a special for now? Yeah. Oh, see, you're great. Look, we got Rocco here is in the middle, just kind of running this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you guys most excited about for your characters coming back? Uh, about what they're going to be kind of interacting with in the new modern world? Oh, it's so Rocco for me to pass the mic. It's okay. I don't need to talk. <laughs> um, as Joe said, it's kind of reintroducing a classic cartoon to a new generation of, of, of people, and that includes the people that are of this world. Uh, as you know, uh, part of the plot of Static Kling is that, and we can say this, they were trapped in 1996 out in space, and they returned to the modern world with YouTubes and phones and cell phones and technology. And um, it's weird for Rocco, because Rocco's so Winnie the Poohish, he's just like, what is this thing, you know? I think for Hef and, and, uh, and uh, Filbert, it's more of a thrill, but... Yeah, I think it speaks a lot to maybe some of the fans that grew up with it in the 90s and like, how would Rocco and his cohorts exist in this world? And it's kind of a, a fun reveal to see how it goes. And so it's fun to take that journey. What about uh, Sir and Mrs. Bakehead? Well, Beverly, darling. Beverly has always been very progressive. And so now she's a very progressive feminist. And um, Ed is um, up and coming and big in his company. And... Everybody's very happy to see her. Beverly, especially, is thrilled to see her little Rocco come back. Because now there's internet. <laughs> listen, listen, nothing's going to happen, Mrs. Bighead. Just get it through your head. We'll see, darling. We'll see. <laughs> So what did you guys, I, I have to go back to the beginning of this, when Rocco's Modern Life was first created. How did you guys create these, these such unique characters? Like, was it mainly your brainchild, or how much were you guys involved with creating Rocco and Mr. and Mrs. Big Head and kind of who they are? Uh, well, I came up with the original characters, but everything evolves when the voice actors get involved. They bring a lot to the to the the mix. Storyboard artists that helped write. Doug Lawrence was, was like one of the largest contributors to to Rocco. So it was a very, it was a team effort. You know, it's like, I bring, I, I kind of set the, the place for people to play and everybody played and, and brought out new things. So Yeah, because uh, yeah. Joe, Joe, Joe created the sandbox that yeah. we were allowed to play and we did. And it, it not just gave us permission to do what we do, but really elevated us and and let us run wild because this particular group is very disturbed. <laughs> and when we're together, it feels very uh, electric. It feels very connective. I can't explain it any more than that. Yeah. Uh, back to the very beginning, and Joe will probably tell you as well, 1991 or 1990, uh, a person named George Maestri and Nick Jennings is with Joe Murray in a garage in uh, near Sutro Towers in San Francisco. He was a San Jose Mercury cartoonist. And um, I have to tell the story too beyond this, but we go in, a lot of people are auditioning. I'm not experienced. I made a tape. I knew a uh, person who knew the producer, Mark McNamara, I believe. Uh, and uh, I go in an audition and they didn't want an Australian accent. That was for certain. They wanted maybe a Woody Allen or, and then I, I did Spunky at first. I was like, uh, let me, he's crazy. <laughs> And Nick Jennings leapt out of his chair and said, oh my God, you're spunky. And I'm like, okay, good, I'm in. And uh, I didn't know what to do, and so I just started doing Gene Wilder, like, give you are not evil, you are good. And I think that I remember that impressing Joe and everybody else. I'm like, oh good, I can stay in the room. And so I think we pulled out a vacuum uh, manual, and I just said, plug, um, you plug, take hose C and plug it into slot A. And they thought, you know what, that sounds kind of cool. And we passed it off to the Nickelodeon Brass and Mary Harrington, and they approved, and we made a pilot at Poolside Studios on Lombard Street, not the fancy part, Lombard and Steiner, behind a Mel's Diner. <laughs> and then we, the rest is history, and the first session we come in, we know it's going to series, 
Uh, Tom and I are pretty green at it, and we come into the first session, and Charlie is there, sitting down, going, ah, boo, blah, 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 and papers are flying up the, and he's like, I'm done. And we were like, I don't know what I'm doing. And we went from there, and that, that is how I remember the origin well, story. I was, old and ja- I was old and jaded when they were starting, so, yeah, Charlie, Charlie, I mean, I'm a fossil like, now. Can we just get on with it now? <laughs> Jeez. What's changed? Tom and Carlos are like riffing. What's right changed? Here. And I'm going. What? Nothing's changed. Nothing. <laughs> but you, Nothing. It, it, I'm a calmer now. In terms of the origin of the story, I remember. I think uh, pretty I recently, Joe told me a story when he was a kid. He used to sell Christmas trees door to door, and he said, but he actually wouldn't sell the tree. They would sell a, a slip of paper, a ticket that you would buy to go to a lot to get the tree. But when you got there, the trees were really bad. And I go, Joe, that is so Rocco. So I think Rocco is born out of his shell because I could imagine going, uh, hello, um, we're selling Christmas trees. Well, actually, they're not trees. They're ticket and it's a really great lot and the trees are really nice cut to no, that, that was actually when uh, one of the things was so great is that i was able we had satire you know woven through the whole show and i was able to take my my childhood and my current life and put it all into the show and and the fact is is that this this new special is about a network coming to the creator of the show and asking, can you do a special for a 20-year-old property? So it really, like, all comes back, you know. So you can just pull from experience. And, yeah. can, I, can I add something Absolutely. about, about the special? Oh, my God, I could just, like, well, tell you, you, you the stories <laughs> about Rocco's We were, we were just so excited about the possibility of being together and working together and bringing this back up because you get very connected to your characters. I, I fall in love with my characters. I miss them. Yeah. So some characters I've done, I just talked to my dog for 30 years as these people. <laughs> uh, dogs, uh, dogs, uh, dogs. Uh. Um, but when we, when I got the script, I was really laughing out loud. I thought it was so hilarious, knowing that anything can happen. It might not read as well, or it will read better. When we got in the room and started doing it, it was lightning in a bottle. I think I'm excited for this because it just, it's really wonderful. Me too. And do, I think do, we do, are. do you guys? Do you guys have an air date for when the special will be on? Oh, this is 2018. <laughs> 2018. So get excited. Is is there a place that we can kind of follow the adventures of Rocco on social media right now to like wait till we hear about it or where can where can we follow at Nickelodeon? Okay. Uh, on Twitter. On Twitter. A splat, I think, splat. Uh, splat. Facebook site that keeps you posted on. Amazing. And, and everybody, I'm part of the cast, I'm, I'm on social media, so as soon as we are allowed to say things, at Carlos Ellis Rocky Twitter, we will be announcing what we are allowed to announce in terms of, you can follow it via myself and or, or Charlie. Social media channels. Yeah, Charlie Adler, I guess. Is that, that is my name, isn't it? It is. Uh, yes. It was last night. <laughs> it was, well, no, no, that wasn't my name last night. <laughs> oh, what, Joe? Joe? Joe Murray Studio. Com. Joe Murray Studio. Oh, there's that. Fine. You can get in, inside news on that. And all of us. And Tom Kenny is on somewhere, but he never does he's it. Not. No, Tom. Oh, he's not? No. Oh, well, no wonder he doesn't answer me when I Twitter on it. <laughs> so one more question before I let you guys go. Favorite episode from, the, from when the series was originally airing? I think we all have different ones. Well, I, I, you, go ahead. I, I, uh, can't squeeze a cheer from a Christmas log? Um... Uh, written by, I believe, Doug Lawrence. Um, and I like it because it's a quintessential uh, episode where Rocco is at his sweetest. There's a little Christmas elf, and he's, he doesn't know where he's good. He's like, we'll help you, little friend. And I think it, that that episode for me encapsulates just uh, the sweetness of that character. And so it is beautiful, and it's wonderful and crazy. And so, But my favorite line of all time is when Rocco fa- finds his favorite childhood toy in a garage, and it's in a box. And Rocky goes, who are you? And he goes, don't you remember me, Rocco? I'm your favorite childhood toy, Mr. Onionhead. And he says, I love you, Mr. Onionhead. And that's my favorite line. Do you have a favorite episode? <laughs> I can't follow that. Uh, Wacky Deli is my favorite yeah. episode. Yeah. Well, we have this character Ralph Bighead, who's actually in the in the special also, uh, who's kind of loosely on me, but it has it's someone who needs to find their way after doing a a, a, a network show, and um, he ends up trying to kill the project by hiring Rocco and Heifer and Filbert to do their version of a show, and it turns out to be a big hit because it's so horrible. So. Um, 
Yeah, it was really, it was, it was a lot of fun. Everybody did. Uh, favorite? Yeah. Favorite. Well, this is totally, totally selfish. When Bev got a nose, I I laughed through that. The the whole like, you're so insane. Did Doug write that script? You who wrote? I know who wrote it. it. It was so insane. And then to actually see it play, and then she realizes once she has a nose, and she, she looks. I, can't, I, I don't want to make a comparison, but. But she can't smell her husband. I mean, she can't stand his smell anymore. So then she goes to a support group with people with nose. It was just, it was hilarious. Yeah. But I, 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 we could come up with, how many episodes did we do? 80? 52. But we say it's 80 because we yeah. live in a, la- a, la- a time of, of exaggeration. And, yeah. and it was the best. It was huge. It was huge. It was huge. Bigly. Very bigly. Well, thank you guys so much. Like, I've been cracking up this whole interview. I'm so honored to be able to interview all of you guys and hear you guys do your voices. And thank you for Rocco's Modern Life. And thank you, Nickelodeon, for bringing it back. Um, I'm so excited. And have a great Comic-Con, you. you guys. Thank, thank you all so thank much. You guys are amazing. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all.